Section 19 of The Rise and Fall of Prohibition. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phyllis Vincelli. The Rise and Fall of Prohibition by Charles Hanson Town. Section 19. Chapter 16. Literature and Prohibition. The young old philosopher has recently been traveling over the country as far west as the coast. He had heard that conditions, so far as prohibition was concerned, were excellent out there, but he wished to observe for himself. He found them quite the contrary. In states like Oregon and Washington, which went dry long before national prohibition became an established fact, the people were obtaining anything they desired. Close to the border there is plenty of bootlegging, endless daring adventure in the liquor traffic, many a bold plunge over the line to bring whiskey and gin into United States territory. And they certainly bring it. Meanwhile, the propaganda of the Puritan goes on, or rather the impropaganda, for it is not true that people are behaving themselves. There is just as much discontent and disorder among Westerners as among Easterners, so the young old philosopher observed. But in cities like Omaha, which is about in the center of the country, there is a dryness which is depressing. Passing through a hotel corridor one day at noon, the young old philosopher heard male voices chanting in unison. He stepped to the open door of a private dining room and was much amused to see a group of forty or fifty solid businessmen, all wearing little badges proclaiming their allegiance to some organization or other, standing about the tables lifting high their glasses of water and shouting these words with the feed on the table and a good song ringing clear there was a desperate attempt at gaiety a look in the eye of each prospective luncheoner which seemed to say we will have a good time in spite of prohibition but my friend turned away at this travesty on mirth and good fellowship. He wondered if Richard Hovey was not turning in his grave at the cruel editing of his deathless Stein song, and he counted it a pity that pewter mugs had been superseded by ice-water goblets. And he saw that Gopher Prairie was indeed a dreadful reality. Not that he would have wished to see the law disobeyed, he merely deprecated the tragic fact that this was the pass we had come to this was the drab social order we had definitely arrived at he went disconsolately down the hallway brooding of all those ancient poets who had held it no shame to sing of the vine and the flowing bowl no one had ever written a song in praise of food and he thought if hubby could be edited Soon the Bible itself would hear the snip-snip of the shears, as certain boisterous passages were cut out. And as for poor old Omar, he wondered how soon it would be before he was paraphrased by the reformers somewhat in this manner. Here with a little bread, beneath the bough, a flask of milk, a book of verse, and thou, beside me singing in the wilderness ah paradise were wilderness enow and of course quatrains like this would soon be omitted from all editions why be this juice the growth of god who dare blaspheme the twisted tendril as a snare a blessing we should use it should we not and if a curse why then who set it there the story of the marriage feast at Cana must make sorry reading for any prohibitionist, and the young old philosopher doubts not that it will be torn from the records in years to come. 
we shall not even be given the pleasure of reading about the jubilations of vanished times times rich in banquets think of imperial rome without golden goblets they were as much a part of the feast as the fruit and the lights and if we are to be deprived of the vicarious joy of dipping into the pagan past might we not just as well renounce life entirely red wine will be as antiquated as the ermine and crowns of kings my friend believes yet who can deny the picturesqueness of the sceptre and the court fool they may not have been important but they gave a glamour to dreary days and some of us may prefer them says the young old philosopher to the dandruff-covered collars of stupid senators and congressmen. There is an old song of Abraham Cowley's, written somewhere between 1618 and 1667, which must give pain to any prohibitionist. Will they strive to bowdlerize the anthologies, a race from literature so true and human a poem as this, which voices a thought almost as old as the world it is after anacreon the thirsty earth soaks up the rain and drinks and gapes for drink again the plants suck in the earth and are with constant drinking fresh and fair the sea itself which one would think should have but little need of drink drinks twice ten thousand rivers up so filled that they o'erflow the cup the busy sun and one would guess by drunken's fiery face no less drinks up the sea and when he's done the moon and stars drink up the sun they drink and dance by their own light they drink and revel all the night nothing in nature's sober found but an eternal health goes round fill up the bowl then fill it high fill all the glasses there for why should every creature drink but i why men of morals tell me why think of losing from english literature lines like these from the last poems of a e hausman could man be drunk for ever with liquor love or fights leaf should i rouse at morning and leaf lie down at nights but men at whiles are sober and think by fits and starts and if they think they fasten their hands upon their hearts and so modern and exquisite a poet as richard le gallienne has had much to say metrically of the follies of attempting to regulate by law the natural appetites of man he sounds a warning in this tragic comic ballad spurning the busy-body reformers they took away your drink from you the kind old humanizing glass soon they will take tobacco too and next they'll take our demitasse don't say the bill will never pass nor this my warning word disdain you said it once you silly ass don't make the same mistake again we know them now the bloodless crew we know them all too well alas there's nothing that they wouldn't do to make the world a bible class though against bottled beer or bass i search the sacred text in vain to find a whisper by the mass don't make the same mistake again beware these legislators blue pouring their moral poison gas on all the joys our fathers knew the very flowers in the grass are safe no more and lad and lass where the old birch rod and the cane here comes our modern hudebra don't make the same mistake again envoy prince vanished is the rail of brass so mark me well and my refrain tobacco next you silly ass don't make the same mistake again it would be sad indeed to lose such a song as drink to me only with thine eyes 
how much poorer the garden of poetry would be without such bibulous planters of rhyme as burns and poe and verlaine i suppose the paid puritans would have even our poets walk the humdrum way so that we would have no news of life from taverns and inns the picturesque vagabond the rapscallion son of song must be pulled in from the pleasant highways and made to conform conform to what a three-room flat with kitchenette and running water and a clerk's desk downtown with methodical rides on a heaving subway train at eight in the morning and again at six in the evening while well, there are other modes of living that seem a trifle sweeter to the dreamers of dreams the makers of beauty art is not produced like so many bricks or like so many waffles in a waffle iron it is shot with wonder and just as the water lily emerges in its white perfection from dubious slimy stems so a great work of loveliness may sometimes rise from the meanest sources that is what your pharisee does not and cannot understand he would cast us all into one mess pot stew us all in the same juice and bid us all conform to some stupid ideal which he has the effrontery to hold before the artist as the ultimate goodness end of section nineteen